witness. So a lot of times you, okay, we're on? Good. All right, so we're in Revelation chapter number 2, verses 12 through 17. Revelation 2, 12 through 17. And we began our study and reading there. But I'm likening our relationship with Jesus Christ to a marriage. A marriage in which God is faithful. Jesus Christ is faithful. We don't have to worry about Jesus stepping out on us. Because the Bible says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's never going to abandon us. Even in our greatest time of need, he's faithful unto the end. Right? And we can look back and we can see how he was faithful even unto death, even the death of the cross. Right? So he went all the way and did everything that the Father wanted him to do according to the will of the Father. He took our sins. He washed us in his own blood, his sacrifice. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. But you know what? I mean, a common theme throughout the entire Bible is, is that we're not usually as faithful to him. Right. Normally we walk out on God. He doesn't walk out on us. And then we tend to blame him for things that take place in our lives. But this morning I want to talk about one of the great blessings of the book of Revelation in chapter number two. There's in verse number 17. I'm going to read this part just the beginning of verse 17. Well, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh. Before. Before you can have everything completed in Christ, you have to become an overcomer. Now, I've heard this preached by Assembly of God, Church of God, a lot of Pentecostals, that this means you got to hold out faithful to the end. That means you got to hold on to your salvation. That's what many of them teach. And it's a misinterpretation of the word overcometh. Now, I want you to notice here, I'm going to read some of the other passages in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that bring up the same exact thing. In chapter number 2, verse number 7, the Bible reads, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, I want to look at verse number 11 in the same chapter. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt in the second death. And then obviously verse number 17. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now I want to look at verse number 26. <clears throat> chapter 2 and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations I'm, I'm going to stop on that one just for one second because that's one of the verses that uh, these different churches will use to say see you got to hold out faithful to the end you got to just hold on to it because if you don't you're not saved But that's not what that verse says, because the verse underneath it says this, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken into shivers, even as I received of my father. That is actually talking about the millennial reign of Christ, that you will be able to rule and reign with Christ. But you had better be an overcomer in order to do it. And that doesn't mean holding out faithful to the end. Because the truth is, I can't even hold out faithful to the end. Look, I have my doubts on things. I see the way the world's going. I am but flesh. I fall apart daily. I have to bring my sins. I have to bring my uh, unloyalty to God to the cross every day. His mercies are new every day, right? I need to come boldly to the throne of grace, right? I mean, that's what I need to do daily, right? That's what we all need to do. That's what the verse is talking about. We will have power over the nations. Why? Because we're going to rule and reign with Christ. See, chapter number one, verse number six says we're kings and priests. So we get to rule and reign with Christ in the millennium. Chapter number three, verse number five. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, before his angels. 
Verse number 12 of the same chapter, chapter 3. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go, in, he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. I'll go down to verse number 21. Chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, and as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So there's the same theme written to all these churches that they need to overcome. They need to overcome. And I believe God uses John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not just to use the book of Revelation to explain who an overcomer is, but that's why he was able to write uh, the gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then the book of Revelation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he was able to pen these. So it it doesn't come as a shock to me that all three of those, or all five of those are actually kind of tied together, right? And, And you say, how is that so? Because there's a lot of the same doctrine, there's a lot of the same wording, there's a lot of the same words and writing styles in those five books. And this way, we can go back through these books and we can understand who an overcomer is. The problem with many churches and a problem today is that they'll take a verse and they'll just take that verse and they'll run with it. They'll preach a whole doctrine on it and they'll say, you better do this. This is how it's done. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of false doctrine takes place is because they're not comparing spiritual with spiritual. So turn to 1 John First John, because I want to show you something. Keep, keep your bookmark there in Revelation chapter number 2 and 3. But I want to show you something because this is really important. This is an overcomer. First John chapter 5, verse number 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So whosoever believeth that Jesus is the anointed of God, he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the chosen one, right? is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now this is actually talking about brotherly love in the church, right? We're to love one another because that's what he just got done preaching about in chapter number four, that we are to love our brothers. So everybody who's begotten, brought forth of God, everyone who's saved should love one another in the church, right? That's Pretty much in the context of what the Bible teaches in 1 John. But in verse number 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, this is a defining line on who an overcomer is. An overcomer is someone that believes the Bible concerning Jesus. And if you look at all the false religions today, they all manipulate or pervert part of who Jesus is. Jesus was born of a virgin. That is extremely important because, see, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us, right? There's a sign. You know, Charlie Brown Christmas special uh, talks more about Jesus Christ than most churches today. Brings forth the sign. Why is that sign so important? Because that sign is so important because the great deception is in the end times, there's going to come another guy after his own name who's just going to come back from the dead. But for those who were waiting for the sign, what sign were they waiting for? Born of a virgin. Do you realize that there are many religions that profess to be Christian but do not believe Jesus Christ was born of a virgin? Well, the Bible says they're antichrist. 
And there's many antichrists out there today. What does it also mean? That Jesus, and when they say that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, or he's not God, or I don't believe in a trinity, or I don't believe he's the Messiah, or I don't believe he's this or that. When you start limiting who Jesus Christ is, you have now not become an overcomer. Because now Jesus cannot be espoused or married to you because you have not accepted him. When Brother Dave went up to Miss April, I mean, I hope it was only one time he had to say, will you marry me? But let me ask you a question. If she rejected him, are they married? No, they're not. They're not together. So he goes up and he asks her, you know, Miss April, will you marry me? And there's a courtship and he's, 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 at, he's probably begging. No, I'm just, <laughs> please marry me no so he's, he's going and he's asking and she says okay but how many what if what if she rejected him like a hundred times I mean at some point he's going to go off and say you know what we're not going to be married right because he's not going to ask forever he's going to go marry someone else right I was going to say something but I won't I love brother David <laughs> But that's the truth. That's what we have to remember. Someone who overcomes is one who accepts Jesus Christ for who he is. Now, in the same chapter, let's find out who he is. Verse number 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And remember in Revelation chapter 2, it says, he that doesn't overcome will be hurt in the second death. Right. Same thing in the in, in the in the book of Jude, it says the exact same exact same thing. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Okay, so if you die without Jesus Christ, if you're not an overcomer, if you have not put all your faith in the Jesus Christ of your Bible, not of your religion, your Bible, then you are not an overcomer and you do not have Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Verse number 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. God. And we know his name to be Jesus, right? Jesus. But the reason why I think that the Bible looks a little redundant here is because I also believe that if I were to use it like this, these things have I written unto you that believe on the power of the Son of God. Power. Because there's power in the name of Jesus, right? You know, and sometimes the Bible says this, and it, and it looks somewhat cryptic. I'm not blaspheming the King James Bible here, but I'm showing you sometimes we need to look deeper into what the Bible actually says when it says in Acts chapter 2 that you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There are religions out there that are saying, if you're not baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then you're not saved at all. That you can't be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's the name of Jesus because they make Jesus God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit it's called Pentecostal oneness doctrine and that's a false doctrine because the Bible doesn't say in Acts chapter 2 baptize in the name of Jesus Christ it's saying baptize in the power of Jesus Christ because the entire Acts chapter 2 is Peter explaining to them their history who they've rejected and then they say to him sirs what must we do to be saved and so now they have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they have to be baptized in the name or the power it's just like when Huey Lewis came out with that song the power of love right? The name of love, the power. All right, stop in the name of the law. Stop in the power of the law, right? Because what's the name of the law? What's the name of love, right? So it's the same thing. You have to know the power of God. You have to know the power of his son. You have to know who Jesus is. Nobody ever got saved who did not know who Jesus was. When we went out soul winning yesterday, everyone we talked to, we were very careful in explaining the gospel when we were able to give it out. The death, the burial, the resurrection. It's extremely important that we go over these things because you know what? There's coming a false Christ, right? Who has a death. Maybe a burial, maybe just a public, you know, open casket. I don't know. 
but he'll also have a resurrection. But that doesn't make him God, right? He's Antichrist, because God's already come. So he that overcometh, he that overcometh is one that believes Jesus is who he says he is. Look at verse number 20, verse number 20 of the same chapter. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding. So just quickly, without turning there, 1 John in chapter number 2 says we have an unction from the Holy One, and we need not that any man teach us. It also says that we have an anointing, which means what? Well, if we looked at verse number 10, we have God in us, right? We have the Holy Spirit of God in us, so we should have an understanding of who he is. If you think you're stay, saved today and you don't understand who Jesus Christ is, you're probably not saved. Matter of fact, I go on to say you're not saved. You need to understand who Jesus Christ is. You can't call on the power of Jesus Christ if you don't know who that power is. So many are calling on the power of the United States government to save them today, Right? They are. They're calling on the government to deliver them from the pandemic, from their financial destruction. They're calling on rocket man Joe Biden. Who saw that? Joe Biden's in this interview where he's holding his hands like this for like 15 minutes. I'm like, who does that? I mean, if I stood here and preached like this, would you not think I'm some weirdo? Yet there's some guy running the nation and he's holding his hands like this. It's almost like the guy can't stand up and they got some prop up his back and holding his arms out so he doesn't fall down. Right? And then all the memes come out where he's the rocket man shooting up because he's holding it, he's got a jet pack. And they're talking about inflation. It's hilarious. I don't have faith in that man. I don't have faith in the other man either. I have faith in this man, Jesus Christ. My faith is in the Lord. That's who I've trusted. I know in whom I've believed. Do you? He's the Jesus of the Bible. He's the Jesus of the Old Testament. He's the Jesus of the New Testament. There is no difference in Jesus. Right? How can you say that? I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. What's that mean to you? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He never left Adam and Eve, and he's never going to leave you during the millennial reign of Christ when the devil comes back to try to encamp, encamp the uh, camp of the saints with all the armies. He's going to bomb them and destroy them. Why? Because he's not going to leave us. He's more faithful to us than we are to him. He's our faithful witness. Right? At least that's what I get out of the Bible. And we have the understanding. The Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. What's that understanding? That we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even in his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. So there we have it. Jesus is the true God. And it's not blasphemy to say that. Because God the Father is the true God. And God, the Holy Spirit's the true God. I explain it. I don't have to. I have faith. I just believe it. See, sometimes you have to stop with what makes sense, and in comes your faith. You have to have faith in who Jesus is. Who's seen Jesus? Nobody. Nobody in here has seen him personally. But I see him in my heart. I don't know what he looks like. That's not important. But what I do see is him, and I see him on the pages of this book. And I have an understanding, right? And if you're saved today, you have an understanding when you read the Bible. That doesn't mean you're going to understand everything in the Bible. There are some things that are hard to be understood, which Paul wrote in his epistles. Peter talks about it, right? There are difficult doctrines to understand. Well, let's go look at an easy one in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. <clears throat> see if the Bible lines up. Second Corinthians chapter number 11. So I got I to gotta read fast and talk fast. You'll have to listen fast. Verse number one of Second Corinthians 11. Would to God ye bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So throughout the entire Bible, we are likened unto the marriage of the Lamb. Now, Brother Sean's doing a study on the marriage supper of the Lamb. Not an easy study. Not. It isn't. It's a hard study. But I believe it's going to take place. 
And I believe I'm going to eat food for the first time and not get fat. <laughs> right? I'll be in my new body. I know I'm not going to get up from the plate and have to loosen my belt. Right? But here's the thing. I believe it. Right? And I have faith. I know, and what we read in 1 John chapter 5 was, he is in us. He is in us. Now, I've heard, you know what? I've heard some very wicked doctrine over the years that have likened our relationship to Jesus Christ as something that is perverted, actually. I've heard a lot of weird doctrines out there. There are some false prophets out there that have corrupted the minds of many people, thinking that marriage has something to do with sex. Thinking marriage has something to do with that. Marriage has to do with love. It has to do with faithfulness. It has to do with a bond between two people that should not be broken. Malachi chapter 2 says God hates the putting away. Why does he hate it? Because he's not going to put you away. So why are you, because of the hardness of your heart, going to put your spouse away? Right? And I can preach really hard on this doctrine of why you should stay faithful to the end to your wife and your husband, vice versa. Right? Because Jesus is faithful to you, but yet Christians want to run out and be like the world and get divorced over the first bad thing that happens. You got to hold out in that marriage. Right? And that's what Jesus is doing to you, so you ought to do it to your spouse. Hold on! He's not leaving you or forsaking you, but so many walk out the door. And that's why America's going to hell in a handbasket. There, I said it. There's the hard part of the sermon. But it's truly a blessing when we look at marriage and we compare it to a marriage that Christ is in us. It's not a weird perversion, but yet man has made it so. Look at verse number three. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through the subtlety so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's so easy to get saved. Even a child can do it. Oh, I don't know if that kid got saved when he was nine. Hey, bless God, I got saved when I was nine. And I knew what I was doing wrong from the time I was nine all the way up until I've tried to get right with God. But I still fall short daily. I'm not an overcomer in the aspect of keeping my salvation. I'm an overcomer because I'm a spouse to Christ. Amen. I'm an overcomer because he took care of it for me. I'm an overcomer because I'm married to him. I am his. He's the bridegroom. And he's not going to come late, trust me. This is a dark hour in human history. But he's not going to come late. But get this in verse number four. For he that cometh preaches another Jesus. What does that mean? A different Jesus. They're preaching a Jesus. A oneness Jesus. That's all three in one. And his name is Jesus. So get baptized in his name. That's Pentecostal oneism. Oh, he's a Jesus. He's the architect of God. That's Jehovah's Witness. He's a Jesus in the Mormon religion who's going to end up, you're going to be just like Jesus, and you're going to get your own planet and your own wives and your own weird religion with flying saucers and all kinds of crazy things. I mean, how's anybody a Mormon today? I don't get that. Or how about the Muslims? They have a Jesus. Even Judaism has a Jesus. What do you mean? They don't believe in Jesus. No, they're looking for a Messiah. So they have a false Jesus. They're looking for because Messiah's already come. You either believe it or you don't, right? Everybody has a Messiah. Everybody has a Jesus. Which one do you have? He that cometh and pre preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached or ye have received a another spirit. What's that? Another understanding. It isn't the understanding of God. Many, and this is why I can say a false preacher is not saved. Because if he's going out and preaching another Jesus by another spirit, he doesn't have the spirit of God. Right? Does that mean that God can't save him? Look, I'm going to leave that up to God. But this is one thing that I do know. That if you don't keep all in this book, if you just go off and start preaching false doctrine and you're preaching it, you're making people twofold, twofold more a child of the devil than ye yourselves, according to Jesus in Matthew 23. You're making people twofold more a child of the devil than ye yourselves. You are corrupting people. You are sending them to hell. And I believe God judges those people. And you see that in the Bible when they stand before him and they say, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not do many mighty works in your name? Hey, Judas Iscariot wasn't saved. These false preachers aren't saved. Because they're preaching another Jesus by another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, 
which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with me him. What's that mean? You got another Jesus by another spirit preaching a false hope or a false good news. Right? Because the gospel means good news. So you need to know, hey, look, if I overcome the world, it's because I have Jesus Christ. This is not my home. I'm just passing through. Right? Thank God I am. Because 20 years from now, uh, things are going to start falling apart even more than they already have. And I'll be more ready for my new home than ever before. And if I ever even hit 80 years old or 90, I will be ready to go. I want to see the new Jerusalem at that point. So I just want to leave you with a few things about the blessing of God upon your belief in who he is. Jeremiah, turn to Jeremiah chapter number 17 quickly, because obviously this is also in the Old Testament. This is the theme throughout the entire word of God. Let's just start in Jeremiah 17, verse number 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try at the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days, and the end shall be as a fool. Hey, look, Jesus said, trust not in riches. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Right? Oh, yeah. I mean, throughout my entire life, I've worried about money until the day I quit worrying and said, Jesus, I trust you. It's your job, not mine. I'll work hard. I'll do my part because, you know, he that doesn't take care of his, home, uh, of his own is worse than an infidel. And if a man shouldn't work, he shouldn't eat. I'm not sitting at home saying, God, pour out the blessing for no reason. I'm out there working hard. Hard work meets opportunity. God gives the opportunity and gives you more work. Not, hey, here you go. I'm just going to just drop manna from heaven. Although he could, right? But that's usually not how God works. Look at verse number 12. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed. And they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Now, I think that's really fascinating. All that depart from me. All those who reject Jesus Christ. All those that reject the Messiah. The coming anointed. All those who were not looking for the king. Who were not looking the right way. You know, it's like when the, when the Antichrist comes. He comes in his own name. What did Jesus say? I come in my father's name and you receive me not. Another will come in his own name and him you'll receive. So what's that mean? They're going to take the mark of the beast. What's that mean? They're not going to heaven. Period. Why? Because their heart. So their name is written in the earth, not the Lamb's book of life. See, if you remember to what I read in chapter number two, it says that he will give you a white stone and there's a new name written in it. Right? That's what I read. You're going to get a new name. Now, here's the thing. I don't want my new name to be interpreted into mediocrity. I want my new name to be the name that is closest to what Abraham will have, friend of God, right? Because I guarantee you when Abraham gets his new name, it's going to say something of faithful, friend of God, obedient, not perfect, obedient, right? We shouldn't settle for our new name to be, well, you barely made it in new name, right? By, the, by fire, you made it in. You know, you were saved, barely. Just, you know, you overcame in salvation only. I don't want that to be my new name. But these people have it way worse. I'd rather that be my new name than this be my new name. Because they'll have their name written in the earth. Because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. We knew that through the whole New Testament. Jesus, out of his belly flows uh, fountains of living waters, right? We're never going to thirst again. He went to the Samaritan woman and said, hey, if you knew who it was that asked you to drink, you'd ask of me water, right? Because he has the living water. Because he's God. Verse number 14, heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For thou art my 
praise. Behold, they say unto me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee, neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. Because I confessed with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. I am saved. Right? And the one who's not preaching that as salvation is not a pastor of righteousness. He's preaching another Jesus by another spirit, another gospel. Right? You have to know who Jesus is. You are not going to overcome if you don't know who he is. You are not going to overcome if you don't know he's the true God. You're not going to overcome if you don't know he's the son of God. You're not going to overcome if he didn't wash your sins in his own blood, John MacArthur. You're not going to overcome if you don't believe he's God Almighty. I mean, I could go on and on. I listen to these false preachers. Hey, when you know the word of God, the false preachers, they stick out like, a, like, like some a green tomato in a red tomato patch. I mean, you see them a mile away. You're like, oh, there's a green tomato. Who likes those? I want a red tomato on my hamburger. Right? I don't know how I go off on that. Anyway, <clears throat> that which came from my lips is right before him. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Hey, all blasphemy against the Son of Man shall be forgiven in this life. But blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven in this life or the next. For out of thy mouth, or, or for by thy words thou shalt be forgiven and justified, but also by thy words thou shalt be condemned. What condemns you? Jesus isn't Christ. Jesus isn't the only way. There's another way. Jesus isn't the Son of God. Jesus isn't God. Jesus isn't this, or Jesus isn't that. Bless God, Jesus is everything. Period. It's us that fail. It's us that leave him. Turn quickly to Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62. I'm going to have to go real quick now because, you know, I'd rather just open the doors and if anybody's out there, come on in. Isaiah 62, verse number 1. Get this. Isaiah 62, 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all the kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. You're going to have a new name. You remember the song, I've got a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. You wonder where that song came from? That's why we sing the old hymns. Because I got a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. It's my personal espoused relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ as a bride to the bridegroom. He's going to give me a new name. Why do you think Why do you think we have the tradition that when you get married, you take your husband's name? wonder where that came from. Everything we do comes from this book. Right? Everything. Oh, God's not real. It doesn't come from the book. Okay, whatever. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. He's going to give you a white stone. And here's another thing real quick. Do you ever wonder why we give our wives diamonds when we marry them? A diamond's a white stone. How do you know it's the same white stone? Because it says in that stone's a new name. Most of the other stones you can't look into, but a diamond's clarity, based upon how clear it really is, you can look all the way through it. Matter of fact, light reflects and shines out of it. Right? That makes sense to me. And in that diamond, one of the hardest rocks on earth that can write. It, you know, they use diamonds to, to cut glass. They use diamonds to, diamond shavings to cut tile, stone and rock. Hard surface. Right? And it's like, when I look at that, I'm like, you know what? My white stone is my ring from the Lord. My stone. Hey, look, I don't want a one carat. I don't want a two carat. I want as big a carat as he can give me. I want one so big I can carry it on my back because I want everybody to see my name that God gave me, friend of God. Right? Oh, that looks weird in heaven. No, let me tell you something. Everything got, God's got for me, I want it. Period. I want it. See, I get a white stone with a new name. I want a new name. I don't want to be affiliated with the name I have. Right? What do you mean? <clears throat> Failure. Unfaithfulness. Disobedient. That's my name. I want a new name. I want my white stone. 
I want that new stone. I want that new name. I want the Father's name in my forehead. I want the Father to rename me. I want the Son to rename me. I want to be new because I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things become new. I'm still in the flesh. In my life right now, I'm a failure. Right? I fail every day. Oh, that's so depressing. No, because I can go to him, and I know I have a white stone. I know I'm a spouse to Christ. I know I'm the bride of Christ. I know I have a home in heaven. I know I've overcome. I'm going to heaven. I know the Bible. I have the spirit within me. I have the spirit without of me. I have God the Father all over the place. I got the Son everywhere. Hey, why in the world are we walking around like we're beat up? We got God Almighty. God Almighty. The true God. The Son of God. The Holy Spirit of God. Right? And see, what we need to do is put our faith and focus on him. And he'll take care of us. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Right? So we overcome. Turn back to, um, turn back, well, let's see. I do want to read verse number five. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall the sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. You know, that's the amazing part of it. Jesus is going to rejoice over us. And I'm thinking, there's nothing to rejoice concerning me, Lord. Just like Peter said, when Jesus was sitting in front of him and Peter cast his net to the one side, there was nothing. He cast it to the other side, and then there were tons of fish. And then Peter says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man right? Get away from me. I'm not what you think I am. And Jesus, Jesus, knowing who he was, look, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I'm going to make you some, I'm going to make you a chaste virgin for me. I'm good. What's that mean? You're going to be clean. You're going to be undefiled. You're going to get a new name. Down here on earth, you're in your flesh. And I understand that because I'm in human flesh. Now he was perfect, paid for our sins and all those things, but he understood he understood our infirmities. He understood what we're going through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the many blessings we have, Lord. We thank you that we have a new name written down in glory for those that are overcomers, for those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, who he said he is. Lord, I just ask that you would continue to look after those that need your blessings, Lord, this morning, Miss Karen, recovering from her surgery, Lord, um, and so many others, um, Miss Betty as well, and Pastor, and Lord, I just ask that uh, you would just help us to have an open door that we can give the gospel to others, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>